Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining for today's Cardiac College online session. The topic for this afternoon is about the rhythm of your heart, fast, slow, and irregular heartbeats. My name is Paul O. It's uh, my pleasure to join you again today. We've been together for many weeks now. Indeed, we feel like it's a nice community, even though we never get to see each other. And um, just remind us about the, uh, the simple guidance in case there is anybody new online uh, for this session. Reminder that these sessions are for education only. Uh, we'd, we'd ask you to check in with your healthcare provider for specific advice about your own situation. And if you have any questions through this session, and I hope that you will, please enter them into the Q&A box uh, at the lower end of your Zoom screen. We're going to talk about rhythms, and I want to ground that in our prior discussion that we had around the workings of the heart to remind us that the heart is this lovely structure in the middle. It's like a house. It's composed of different walls, uh, different chambers that are rooms, valves that act like windows and doorways. It's got a plumbing system that requires work on occasion through angioplasties and bypasses. And today's topic is the fact that our houses, like our heart, also have electrical systems to go along with all of these different parts. And the issue with heart disease is like the problems that you might experience in our house, that things may break down over time, or indeed sometimes they were just a little bit problematic from the outset. So the plumbing problems lead us to coronary artery disease, problems with the windows and doors lead us to valvular heart disease, problems of the walls of our, of our heart. Uh, lead to diseases of the muscle, so-called cardiomyopathy and heart failure. We're focusing here today on arrhythmias and electrical heart disease. And from the heart structure, we recognize that this is what the electrical wiring of the heart might look like. So here are the four chambers of the heart. On the right side is the RA, or the right atrium. RV, or the right ventricle that receives the blood from the body and pumps it to the lungs. It then comes back to the left atrium, left ventricle, and pumps that all around uh, to the rest of the body. Now the heart knows how to beat together because it's triggered by the electricity that flows through the heart. And the electric electrical system has wiring just like your own house might. And the, the main junction box for the house like the, the box that might be in the basement of your house or in the closet of your condo uh, might be this thing called the sinoatrial node. It sends electricity through the upper chamber of the heart to get to the upper chamber to squeeze. It passes through a junction box called the atrioventricular node. It pauses there just for just a fraction of a second before being distributed all the way around the rest of the heart through the ventricles to cause the big squeeze. So upper chamber, lower chamber, nice electrical flow allows beating to happen. You can then imagine that there are problems that might arise from that, and we might call them in a friendly way that these are irregular kinds of heartbeats, and irregular heartbeats might just be random ones occasionally going here and there. It might be that overall our hearts are going a little bit too slow or too fast, there might be interruptions in the electrical system, so-called blocks in the heart. There might be a common condition called atrial fibrillation, where there's a bunch of different pacemakers for the heart, and we'll talk about that one in detail. Um, and then there's these kind of irregular or skipped ones, usually of not much importance, but they can be felt unusually, and, and you may not be happy with them. So we're gonna go through all of these things in some detail over the next 30 minutes or so. And I'd like to share a couple of resources with you along the way as well. And again, invite in some questions, uh, run them in through the Q&A part of the polling. Okay, so before we talk about abnormal, let's talk about what is the, our usual normal heart rate and rhythm. And I think we're aware that our hearts are beating and you know, if, if we were sitting in a room together, my usual kind of tongue in cheek question would be, please check in with me, are, are your hearts beating right now? Are, are they beating at rest? Do you have to talk to it or 
just is it going? And typically for all of us, our hearts are going on their own and at rest, usually they go at a rate between 60 and 100 beats per minute. Um, it, the electricity starts at the top and then flows downward. This is from the sinus node. So this would be called normal sinus rhythm, meaning the, the activity flows from the top of the heart down to the bottom. And usually at rest, it's between 60 to 100. Now, it's interesting for some of us uh, on the call today that your heart beats may be 60 or even a little bit lower because we do get into um, the effects of medications and other things that might slow us down a little bit. Usually the rhythm of the heart, so if we think about the space between each beat, is nice and evenly paced out. We would call that regular or, um, or, or normal. And so the term normal sinus rhythm is what might be written on an electrocardiogram that you might get from your doctor or from the laboratory. Normal means normal. Sinus means it start up at the top and the rhythm is nice and regular. Normal sinus rhythm is the thing that we would like to achieve. Upper chamber, lower chamber, upper chamber, lower chamber. We're in nice equilibrium. The blood is flowing very nicely. Our electrical system is working. The way that we can actually tell for sure how our hearts are beating is to take an electrical tracing of, of the heart. And that to you is, uh, is known as the electrocardiogram. And if you look at those first three letters, E-C-G. That's kind of the, uh, the North American English version of the electrocardiogram. Some of you may have also heard of this as the E-K-G because the people that invented electrocardiograms, some of the original people were Germans. And cardio in German would be spelt with a K instead of a C. So therefore, we still call them EKGs sometimes, but then you have to figure out what does the K stand for. It's a C cardio, okay? And what the electrocardiogram tracing represents when you see one of these full page printouts with these squiggles that are called one, two, three, AVR, AVL, AVF, V1 through V6, is that you'll see that there are 12 different labels that are put onto these uh, different parts of the tracing. They look slightly different, but overall, there seems to be a consistent pattern to all of this stuff. And what the electrocardiogram, when it's done in 12 different leads, so-called 12 lead electrocardiogram, go figure, really represents 12 different angles on the electricity as it flows from the top of the heart down to the bottom. 12 different camera angles. So that gives us a sense of where the electricity is flowing in a usual way or sometimes in an impaired way in the heart. The electrocardiograms are lovely because they can tell us how fast the heart is beating, whether it's going irregularly, and if there's some areas of stress or damage to the heart, like if you present to the emergency department with a heart attack, that's where we're going to be look, looking on the electrocardiogram for different patterns. We could do the rest of that at a different time, and maybe in a couple of weeks, we can talk about what happens if you're having a heart attack from both the plumbing side, the electrocardiogram side, and maybe some treatments. That might be a good topic. Actually, uh, that reminds me that in the Q&A before the end of this, if you'll write in some topics that you would like to cover off in upcoming sessions, that would be very helpful to me. Okay, 12 lead electrocardiogram. Each of these little beats in here represents a single beat of the heart. And you can appreciate that there are probably three little squiggles that make up that each component. A little tiny bump, a sharp spike, and then a bigger reset. So if I blow that up for you, little tiny bump, sharp spike, and then a reset, this represents different parts of the electricity that are flowing through. And for the people that invented electrocardiograms, instead of calling these waves A, B, C, D, E to denote different segments, they started with the letter P, go figure. So P is the first little bump that happens. Then the sharp spike is called a Q. R, S, and then the reset is called T. The P wave denotes the electrical signal as it travels through the upper chamber of the heart, so-called um, the, the atrial depolarization. That's electricity that flows through the atrium of the heart. 
And then the QRS complex represent electricity as it flows through the main chambers of the heart. And then the T is the reset. And then you're ready to go again. P, Q, R, S, T. P, Q, R, S, T. Those are the electrical impulses as they move through. And you can see on your screen, the electrical impulses are just beating downwards. P, Q, R, S, T. When you do a whole series of these P, Q, R, S, T, when you string them all together, this is called a rhythm strip. This represents the rhythm of your heart. And you can see the heart is very musical and keeps beat very, very nicely and regularly. If we see the P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T, in a regular pattern, this tells us that this is a sinus beat. And we have that desired normal thing called normal sinus rhythm. And the usual rate is about 70 beats per minute for that. Some people, as we said, living with a heart condition may go a little bit slower than 70 or 60. And if in that case, someone just typed this question in, what if your heartbeat was only 50 or 47? Well, if we look at the electrocardiogram in your situation, as long as we've got this P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T, that tells us that the upper chamber is still going, electricity is flowing down. That's still called sinus. But because the beat, the, the, the rate of the beats per minute is a little bit slower, in this case, on what's shown on the screen is about 50 beats per minute, we'll call that a slow beat called bradycardia. Brady meaning slow, cardia referring to the heart. And many people live quite happily with heartbeats in the 50 range, certainly living with heart conditions. As long as you are feeling well with that, able to get up and do everything that you need to do, and if your heartbeat increases as you exercise, then that is perfectly fine, nothing to worry about. We'll talk about in a second where we might get concerned about it going too, too slow. On the other hand, so this is normal beats, this is slow beats, I bet you can imagine what's coming next are situations where you might get too many. And you can see here, this rhythm strip is meant to show you, well, now I've got a whole bunch of beats that are happening in a very short period of time. These beats seem to be coming pretty fast. And in fact, it, per minute, there's about 130 of these beats. I still have this little pattern, P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T. So this still comes from the sinus node in the upper part, flows through to the bottom part, sinus, but now it is fast. Tachy in Latin means fast heart. Sinus, fast heart, 130 beats per minute. And we'll talk about in a second whether that's good or bad for you. Okay, if you wanted some information and want to watch some cartoons about this, the American Heart Association has a lovely little gra uh, graphical cartoon, and you can watch how the heart beats under different situations. For the sake of, of time for this um, webinar, I'm not going to take you through there, but uh, you've got that. If you, if you Google American Heart Association and want to watch some heart rhythms, they'll take you through some animations of that. Okay, so working on the slow side now. Remember, bratty is slow, bratty, cardia, slow heartbeat. So what might cause this? So some people, if you are taking certain kinds of medications called the beta blockers, remember from our medicine session, we said the beta blockers you'll recognize because they end in O-L-O-L. Typically, if you're on one of those medications, it's deliberately trying to, trying to slow your heartbeats. There are other families of medications called calcium channel blockers, which may also slow down the heartbeat. Remember those because those might actually be treatments if our hearts are going too fast. So medications might do this. Interestingly, that if you are a habitual exerciser, if you've been a runner for a long period of time, or um, in the old days, I would have said, if you are Bjorn Borg, the famous Swedish tennis player, he was famous for being a very cool customer on the uh, on the tennis court as well as off the tennis courts. And if you actually checked his pulse rate, he was typically running in the 40s or so. 
because he was so calm and he had such a high level of fitness that his heart was so efficient that it just went very slowly. So that can be a good, normal thing as long as you push out enough blood with every heartbeat to feed your, your brain and other vital organs. So sometimes a slow heartbeat may be a sign of somebody who is well exercised, trained, and has a good fitness level. But sometimes we do look for troubles. There are some hormones, and in particular, the thyroid gland, which lives in this neck. It's thought to be one of these master organs of the body that controls how the rest of the body functions. If you've got just enough thyroid, everything is behaving quite normally, including your heartbeats that go at the right range of 60 to 100. If your thyroid is underactive, then everything seems to slow down. You've, uh, you know, one of the things about Zoom calls is that everybody seems to slow down at some point, and that's the way their voice comes around, their motions come around. Low thyroid is also your temperature might slow down, your bowels might slow down, your nervous system might slow down, and your heartbeats might be slow as well. So if you don't have another good reason for having a slow heartbeat, then your doctor may check your thyroid. It's a simple blood test that can tell you if your thyroid is in the right range or not. And there might also be problems with the electrical system. As we said, if we use the, the analogy of how your house is put together, if you've got electric wires that are 60 or 70 or 80 years old, then there might be some problems with those electrical wires. You can develop a short circuit or a block that might lead to your heart going a little bit too slow. And if that happens, then uh, if that happens, then um, you wouldn't be surprised that if, if things are going too slow, then, then you might run into some trouble and need some help. Okay. Um, so what happens if your heartbeat is too slow and you're experiencing difficulties? Slow heartbeat, low blood flow out of the heart will lead to lightheadedness because you're not getting enough blood pumping out. You may not have enough energy to get through your day. If it's very slow, you're not getting enough blood up to your brain all of a sudden, you may feel like you're going to pass out or actually pass out. So if someone has an unexplained faint and you've got a heart condition, then you should probably get a tape recording done of your heart, so-called Holter monitor, to see if there is a problem with the heart rate and rhythm that might need some other treatment. If you are finding that you're really short of breath because your heart can't keep up, then this might be one of the reasons, the, a slow heartbeat for, for contributing to that. Usually you don't get chest pain per se from a slow heartbeat, but if the heartbeat is so slow that it's not pumping blood around, including to your heart, you may feel unwell. And some people, if the heart, brain is not getting enough blood flow, you may get some mental confusion associated with that as well. So someone's asked a question about a pacemaker and what your heartbeat might look like with your pacemaker. Let's take a second and just talk about pacemakers. We did it a few weeks ago when we talked about the heart and treatments for the heart. I'll remind you about the pacemaker. So if this represents the heart here, and remember inside we've, we've got our own internal electrical wires that are meant to conduct electricity. If we've run into a problem where our own electrical wires are not sending the electricity through, then good news is that you can actually have a new electrical system that's put in through the, through the uh, blood vessels that, that, um, that go to your heart. In this case, the wire is attached up to this little uh, pacemaker device that consists of a battery, a very long lasting battery that lasts for several years. And inside of there is also a little mini computer that's reading the electrical signals all the time. And if it senses that you're not getting enough electricity through the heart in a rapid enough way, then it has the ability to generate an electrical signal that travels down the electric wires to the heart. And someone asked the very smart question, well, what does an electrocardiogram look like if you are being run by a pacemaker? And remember in the normal sinus rhythm, we had a little sharp, little spike called a P wave sharp spike called QRS and then a reset. Here, instead, we've got these little sharp lines in front of every beat here that represents the heart beating. The sharp spike is the electrical signal that comes from the pacemaker. This is an external electrical spike that comes out of this battery. Very cool. So if the battery is sending the spike down to this part of the heart, then the heart responds to that and can trigger the rest of the heart to beat. 
quite amazing of what the pacemaker can do. And these pacemakers can be very smart. You can tell the pacemaker set up to say, I want you to beat at the same point every single time, just go at 60 or 70 beats per minute, or you can set it up that's really smart and says that if your own internal electric, electricity is working very well, then the pacemaker just goes on standby and waits until a time where you've missed a couple beats and then it'll pick up again. Other even smarter pace, pacemakers will read from you either because you're moving or that your blood chemistry changes to say, ah, I think you're moving, I think you're exercising, I should turn up the pace on this pacemaker so that I can keep up with you. These things are called rate responsive pacemakers. And some of you might have these fancier devices that allows you to get through the course here today. But very cool treatment if your heart is going too slow and you need one of these little devices implanted. Okay, so that's too slow. What about the other side too fast? Remember we talked about um, these things called tachycardia and fast pacemakers uh, or, or uh, fast heart rhythms. This is what the fast rhythm might, might look like. And there might be some good causes for this. Like if this was your electrocardiogram when you were um, walking briskly on a treadmill or around the block and you're feeling a little bit of short of breath and a little bit of sweaty and, and, and you and your uh, cardiac rehab professional have said this is the right range for you, then this is a perfectly normal response exercise and I'm very happy for you. Sometimes under periods of stress, whether that's fear, anxiety, emotion, or you've just seen a bear cross your path, then that can also trigger a response where your heart's going fast. And that can also be quite normal. That's your body's response to either getting ready to fight something or run away from something, and that's okay. Back to other hormonal things though that might lead to some troubles. We said, remember the thyroid gland in your neck? If it's normal, the heart beats in a normal way. If your thyroid is very low and you're cold and you're slow, your heart might be too low. On the other hand, if your thyroid's really fast and you're overproducing, then that might lead to fast, unexplained heartbeats. So that might need to be checked out. For some of you that have might have been through a major surgery, or if you live with a condition called anemia, because you might be deficient on iron or other vitamins, then your heart needs to work harder to move things around. And part of that extra hard work is that your heartbeat might be faster than normal. Similarly, if your oxygen levels are low because you've got an infection or you've got lung problems, then low oxygen makes the heart work faster and, and that might be manifest as a rapid heartbeat. If you've got a fever and you're sweaty, then again, one of your responses is it stresses out your heart system and your heartbeat might be fast. Of course, these things would be quite relevant in this time of COVID. And if you've got a respiratory infection and your oxygen is low and you've got a fever, then undoubtedly that your heartbeat was also going fast and that's the extra stress on the heart. There are certain drugs that might cause tachycardia as well. And you know, if you're using illicit drugs, and I hope nobody is, drugs like cocaine, will make the heart go fast because it's a real stimulant for the whole body. And once again, we get into problems with the electrical system. One of the other wear and tear kinds of things, short circuits in the electrical system is that it might not make it go too slow, but it also might go make it go too fast. Think of those short circuits in the electrical system in your walls. And if you're getting sparking and arcing and that sort of thing, the untoward things may be happening in the heart system. So if your heart is going too fast, some people actually feel like they, they actually have no symptoms that they might feel. And uh, sometimes there's very little correlation between the things that we feel and actually what's going on electrically. On the other hand, people seem to be really tuned into their hearts. And if your heart's going excessively fast and it's not pumping out enough blood, then understandably, you don't get enough to your brain, you may faint again. So too fast or too slow might make you faint. Too fast or too slow might make you lightheaded or dizzy. This is the question that we often ask about. Do you feel your heart beating rapidly or palpitations, an awareness of your heart beating or fluttering in the chest? Then that might indicate that your heart's going too quickly. And what I try to do is tap it out and ask uh, patients, what does your heartbeat feel like? Is it regular and fast like that? Or is it irregular and fast? like that. 
and that might give me a clue on what the regular or, or what the rhythm underlying there might be. If you're aware that your pulse is bounding, then that might discern that you've got a tachycardia. Other people have told me they're just aware that heart's beating forcefully, but it's that if it's at a regular kind of pace, then I'm not worried about that. If it's bounding and it's fast, then I'm worried. Some people will experience pressure in their chest or tightness. Some people will experience shortness of breath. And some people may be tired because it's just, again, the heart's not pumping out enough uh, in that situation. So a couple examples of electrocardiograms. You guys are getting very good at this now. The top one is the normal sinus rhythm. P, oops, let me just go back one second. P, QRST, P, QRST. So nice regular spacing, nice regular pattern of those beats. Here below, you'll see two things. One is that the, the number of these beats is high, so it's going fast, and the spacing is quite irregular between them. This is an irregular fast beat. And then if you look at the baseline here, what you don't see is this nice pattern of waveforms a P and a T in particular, that go with every one of these sharp spikes. There's an irregularity to this, and the medical or Latin term for this is called fibrillation underneath. So instead of upper chamber, lower chamber, upper chamber, lower chamber, what that wavy baseline is in fact reading is that it is just fibrillating away. Atrial fibrillation rate 130 beats per minute. And this becomes a fairly common condition as we get older and up to 10% of people in our population right now may be living with atrial fibrillation. I'm sorry, that's my phone going. So why is this important? Well, atrial fibrillation may be important because Uh, atrial fibrillation, uh, so what's causing atrial fibrillation is that uh, instead of the sinus node driving all the electricity, you see these little sharp uh, spikes or stars uh, in this cartoon. Well, it means that there's other places where heartbeats may arise. And if you've got a whole bunch of them firing off all at once, there is this kind of chaos and competition for, for driving the heartbeat. And you get this irregularity. That's problem number one. Problem number two in the upper chamber, if there is chaos, and it's not really beating in a regular way, that blood may start to pool in little pockets of the heart up here. And if blood pools, then that's a setup where the blood may actually congeal and clot. And that's not a good thing, because if you imagine a little blood clot that forms in this upper chamber, well, if a piece of that breaks off and travels to the ventricle and then out to the rest of the body, that's not a good thing that will happen. Um, that's called an embolism and a stroke. Why does atrial fibrillation happen? Well, again, exercise may, may contribute to this. Stress may co contribute to this. High thyroid may contribute to this. All these things that we talked about before with just tachycardia may contribute to this as well. Fever may bring on atrial fibrillation. Certain drugs, in this case, I'm going to invoke alcohol. If we think about alcohol as an example of a drug may bring this on. Um, other things that make the heart stretch. So if you've had heart attacks before, or heart failure, or very long-standing high blood pressure that makes the upper chamber stretch out, then you get more tendency to the irregularity that, that happens. And then the most common thing probably is problems with the electrical system, degeneration, and especially around the sinus, making it so-called sick. Um, and, and that's what might bring on the atrial fibrillation. How do you know if you've got this? Well, you, again, some people don't know at all, but other people may sense this irregularity and rapid heartbeat, palpitations or rapid thumping inside the chest. You may feel dizzy, you may feel sweaty, you may get develop some discomfort, you may get short of breath or anxious, you get, may, more, may get more tired, you may faint, or again, you may not feel any of these things. So the sense you're getting is the symptoms that one feels are not really that specific to irregularities in the heartbeat, but these are the questions that we might be asking you about. Um, and what if you've got this atrial fibrillation? Can you just live with it? And the answer is absolutely yes, many people do. And you may not need to do anything specific about the irregularity, but you may need to do something to prevent complications. And the medical complication that we're most concerned about is stroke. So if the blood clot forms in the upper chamber, breaks off, travels around and lands in your brain, that's what's called the stroke. 
and we don't want that to happen. That's why some of you with atrial fibrillation will also be taking some kind of blood thinning medication. Warfarin or Coumadin, uh, other medications like Pradaxa or Eliquis or Xarelto, medicines that really thin out the blood, reduce the risk of blood clots forming in the heart and those traveling along. And, and they're very good, but powerful medicines that can prevent the risk of stroke. If the heart goes for too long, too fast, then the heart will get tired out. And that's not a surprise. If we make you run forever, then you're going to get tired out. So controlling the rate, at least, bring it, making it go slower, will allow you to have less fatigue. Um, and then, you know, it may compromise blood flow elsewhere. So controlling the rate, at least, sometimes not the rhythm, may be the thing that we do in your future. And the way that we do that, we may offer you some medications. We talked about the beta blockers that slow you down. There are other stronger medicines that try to regulate the electricity in how the heart beats and then resets. Um, and they may work at either getting you out of atrial fibrillation or at least controlling how fast it goes. Um, there are strong medicines like this one called amiodarone that one or two of you might be on that is the best one to regulate and control the heartbeat, but it's also got some side effects associated with, the, with it that can be quite powerful. So we try to use the medicines very carefully and in the best situation. We said blood thinners are also very important. Occasionally, and some of you might have had this experience, that if your heart's going very quickly and it's uncomfortable and your blood pressure is not responding well, you may get yourself to the emergency department, in which case they may offer you an electrical shock that basically resets the heart. And that may allow for um, a permanent reset or maybe a short-term thing. And then other people may need actually some kind of surgical procedure, uh, smart kinds of pacemakers, or other new procedures called ablation, which may be helpful. And I want to just show you ablation for a second. This uh, cartoon demonstrates what goes on with atrial fibrillation here. In this panel is the normal electric, electrical flow going from the top and then down, sinus rhythm. Here we're showing the little uh, areas where atrial fibrillation impulses might be going along. If you can isolate where those things are going, and often they occur up here in the left atrium uh, of, of the heart, if you can identify where that is going on, you can map this out using a wire that is thread up through the groin up to the heart. It's much like the procedure that is done to take pictures of the heart vessels. But in this case, this special electrical catheter has the ability to read electrical signals. And then a separate catheter has the ability to deliver something like a radio signal or freezing um, uh, down the wire to actually try to get rid of those places where there might have been abnormal electrical signals arising. And this cartoon here shows this is the electrical wire that is showing where the electrical impulse is going, uh, and that could deliver a burning or a freezing. Uh, or this kind of special curly type of catheter is demonstrating how you can deliver a radio frequency impulse that creates little tiny burns that hopefully will eliminate uh, pockets where the electrical signals were arising in an abnormal fashion. So that's a really cool new way of dealing with some of these electrical abnormalities. So that's on the upper chamber side, the electrical impulses associated with atrial activity. There are also other kinds of beats that might arise. So orient, orient us on the, on the ECGs again. This is the normal beats, P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T at a nice normal rate of 70. This is called normal sinus rhythm. In this lower one, I think you appreciate that this beat, first one, is pretty normal. P, Q, R, S, T. But then it's immediately followed by this big, broad, strange looking guy. It comes early, so it's premature or early, and it's got a different signal. And in fact, it's not coming from the top part of the heart. It's actually coming from the bottom part of the heart. So it's called a ventricular beat from the bottom. It's early, so it's called premature. So we call these things ventricular premature beats or VPBs. Now, if you just got single one of these beats, not so much a worry. You may or may not feel them. Most people actually don't feel them. And they're only picked up at the time of 
uh, doing an electrocardiogram. If you're checking your pulse in your wrist, though, it might be fooling you because there, you might sense this irregularity. And here, the pulse beat would be one, two, one, two, one, two. So there's a little pause in between. So you might be sensing that there's irregularity there. But again, not so worrisome unto itself. Where we get concerned, so there's the normal sinus beat. Here underneath, you can sense, gosh, this looks really strange. There's a bunch of these wide complex beats. They're going very fast. They're unusual, they're broad, they're pointing in the wrong direction. And this is a whole bunch of beats that are coming from the bottom of the heart. Ventricular, tachycardia meaning going fast. This is a fast, dangerous rhythm when you string together a whole bunch of these ventricular beats all at once. So ventricular tachycardia, this becomes an emergency because this rhythm may just lead to heart stopping completely. And, and that's a very bad thing. This kind of, of rhythm is often associated with problems of the heart that disturb the electrical conduction system. Like if you've had poor blood flow to the heart and you had a heart attack, one or two of them, or if you're in the throes of having a heart attack and you're not getting enough oxygen to the heart tissue, then this is the rhythm that might happen. If you've got a long standing problem with the heart muscle, not only did the muscle get abnormal, but the electrical system in the muscle gets abnormal and they can start to trigger these very abnormal heartbeats. There are certain medications that can lead to this sort of thing. Um, and this is actually connected to the COVID-19 story in some way as well. That again, one of those unusual medications that some people were talking about and getting excited about, remember talking about hydroxychloroquine? Some people, including the American president, were getting so excited about giving that to a whole bunch of people. Well, what we know about drugs like that, very good for certain individuals in the right doses. But if you take a whole bunch of it um, when you are sick, is that at the heart level, when you get drugs like hydroxychloroquine in high levels, that it can trigger abnormal heart rhythms like this, which is clearly not a good thing. If you're taking cocaine, not only may, might it make you go fast, but it can make you go fast in a dangerous way, ventricular tachycardia. And this is why some people die taking drug overdoses. And then finally, electrolyte abnormalities. For those of you who are taking water pills, the reason taking water pills uh, that you might want to get your blood salts checked especially the potassium levels, is that if your potassium levels go very low or very high, it can lead to very abnormal electrical activity like this ventricular tachycardia. Once again, if you've got this, you may not feel anything, but some people feel important things like dizziness, irregular heartbeat, shortness of breath, lightheadedness, passing out, in extreme cases, cardiac arrest. So once again, if you're living with a heart condition and you passed out, then it's very important to get that electrical test done, that Holter monitor to get a recording to see what's going on. Is this too slow? Is it too fast? Can we do something about it? For ventricular tachycardia, medications might be an important thing. You might have one of those ablation procedures done to the lower part of the heart. If you can find one particular spot that's doing it, you might need some kind of surgical operation to remove parts of the heart that are abnormal, or you might need one of these defibrillators put in. And back to that story about the pacemaker kind of setup. Well, there are even smarter pacemakers where the mini computer can read for these abnormal heartbeats. And if it senses you've got one of these really rapid, irregular, dangerous heartbeats going on, like ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia, what the computer would say is, look, your heart's really out of whack here. I'm going to deliver a shock to you internally and reset the heart. So that's quite amazing. And some of you have an implantable cardioverter defibrillator, either because you've had one of these episodes or you might be at risk for one of these episodes. Um, and that's the purpose of this, to be your own personal defibrillator backup, just in case. All right, I've covered off a whole lot of material. If you want some more, there's some lovely resource material at the American Heart Association. If you go to the website, www.heart.org. There's some nice handouts about arrhythmia. The website's really nice. And as I said, you can watch those cartoons about how different kinds of heartbeats might work. And of course, our own resources at Cardiac College Online. Um, if you go to the chapter book called 
how your heart works and common types of heart problems, there is some of this med uh, information that I've shared with you today right there for you as part of your core readings. Okay, lots of material that we've covered. Let me go to the Q&A part of this. Um, and let's see where we can go here. Um, someone asks, are sudden very short spikes in heart rate normal when exercising? And the answer is maybe. It depends on how we might sense those heart rates. If it's you know checking your pulse at your neck or your wrist, then um, we really shouldn't experience sudden sharp spikes like that. If you are feeling it because you've got a device like a watch, and if it seems to go up and down or if you've got a chest strap, usually those very short spikes for a few seconds represent more motion artifact. That is, because your wrist is moving or your chest is moving, the, the sensors may read that as extra heartbeats, but truly, when compared to the gold standard of an electrocardiogram, then probably there isn't anything going on. The caveat is if you've been prone to developing irregular heartbeats, like if you've got atrial fibrillation and you try to exercise, you're quite right that one of the problems that we might get into is little short spikes where the heart rate goes up. So for most people, not a concern, spikes in heart rates, but in certain circumstances, then we might get into a little bit of trouble. But let me show you that I've answered that question live. Okay, another question was, um, when a person experienced a heart attack, um, a so-called non-ST elevation heart attack, um, how does that relate to heartbeat per se? And um, the heart attack itself versus heartbeat, there really isn't a direct relationship usually. When the heart attack is occurring and you're getting pain and you're starving for blood flow into the heart, your heart may respond by a more rapid heartbeat, telling you that it's stressed out. The electrocardiogram may tell us that um, it's not getting enough blood flow and the waveforms may change. Um, the non-ST elevation part of the heart attack denotes, tells me that there's a different part of the electrocardiogram, the ST segment that was changing. Again, maybe that's something we'll do in our next session when we talk about heart attacks, what are they and what do we do for them? So the heartbeat is more um, not the cause of the heart attack, it's along for the ride. It may just tell you that you've been stressed out. Someone asks, is atrial fibrillation, fibrillation associated with vertigo or dizziness? And the answer is maybe. Um, vertigo itself is this sensation of dizziness, but strictly speaking, vertigo is something where the classic question is the whole room is spinning. You're lying down, but the room is spinning round and around and around. You know, I guess in a cartoon way, this is somebody who's got the hangover and everything's spinning. For more medical kinds of things, we can think about an inner ear problem or something else centrally going on that's throwing off our balance. So usually it's not atrial fibrillation that will cause the whole room spinning, but dizziness, meaning I'm trying to get up, I'm trying to do things, and I'm feeling unsteady, or uh, I've got this sense that I'm not just quite right with my equilibrium, but unusual to get the whole spinning sort of phenomenon. And um, one last question from one of our colleagues. We talked about one specific medication called amiodarone, um, which is a the most powerful medication to control heart rhythms and heartbeats that we have. Um, it's it's um, the best rhythm medication, but I said that it's got also got some side effects. And the, the issue with amiodarone is that it gets into the body and stays around there for some time. That's good for the heart because it gets into the heart and regulates the heartbeats, but it also goes to other organs. So if I go from head to toe, that it can get, for instance, get into the eyes and change the coloring of the corneas and it might change our vision somewhat. It can get into um, our lungs and cause some fibrosis in our lungs so we might get some shorter breath and, and that, that can be an important consideration that might limit the amount of amiodarone that we can take. We talked about the thyroid gland a couple of times today that normal thyroid function is good uh, in terms of how the heart works. Amiodarone can get into our uh, into our thyroid glands and initially may cause it to go too high, later may cause it to go too low. So that's important to watch. And then amiodarone might get to our liver 
and interrupt how it's behaving and cause some inflammation in our liver. And then finally, in the old days, when I was a resident, we used to give amiodarone because it was the most strong drug that we had to treat heart rhythms. And sometimes we would dose it far enough that would cause discoloration of the skin. People actually turn blue with their skin. Um, it was in the days before we had these electrical pacemakers and defibrillators that we could offer people. So we only had these medicines to, uh, and, and we would limit the amount of drug that we'd give you once you got some of those side effects. So these days, amiodarone is used very selectively. It tends to be used in smaller doses. You're monitored for the side effects and hopefully you won't get these side effects. Okay. I think that takes us to the end of our conversations today. I don't see any other questions that, uh, that we haven't addressed already. I thank you for your time and participation. Um, let me remind you that tomorrow's session, uh, Tuesday 1 p.m. is the next Walk and Talk with Rob. So please do join us at one o'clock at the usual time for a walk and a talk. So you get educated and you'll get fitter. And I'll also remind you that Tuesday, 10 a.m. is when we do our Women with Heart Online and our uh, manager of research programs um, and a real champion of women's heart health will be joining us. Jessica Nguyen will be speaking about the heart truths, about health behavior change. Why might it be tough for women to do the right things? Usually it's because they have to look after men. But let's hear the, uh, more about this from Jessica. Thank you very much for joining in today. Uh, we, I wish you all a great day of heart health. Take care, and we'll look forward to connecting again soon.